zullen we gewoon... Uh, ja, oh, het is leuk. Okay. En dan moet ik de muis hebben. Dan, uh... ja. <laughs> well, hello everyone. We apologize that we started with a little bit of a delay for today's Google Hangout. Uh, there were all kind of small technical issues that came into the way, but we have solved this now. This is the MOOC, The Changing Global Order. And more specifically, what we do today is we have a presentation of proposals that have been submitted as to how potentially the United Nations Security Council could be adapted or reformed. Now, we have in this course dealt with various topics, and it is amazing to see this very last assignment, a group assignment, was actually entirely voluntary. Uh, people could link up with each other, people could uh, make a submission in terms of a proposal for reform. Now, let me say that we had a very tough task in terms of selecting proposals. Before I get to this process, let me very briefly introduce two experts um, that we will have with us in today's um, Google Hangout session. We have uh, William Pace. William Pace is actually the convener of the Coalition for an International Criminal Court. He is also the executive director of the World Federalist Movement. And what is also fascinating to us is that he is the president of the board of the Center for UN Reform Education. I know that some of you have actually looked at some of the materials that have been submitted. So very much welcome, William Pace. The second expert that we have with us uh, today is uh, Thomas Derfler. Thomas Derfler is a researcher at the University of Bamberg in Germany. He is also concluding a uh, dissertation on the Security Council and the sanctions uh, regime. And Thomas Der Derfler has quite a few publications already on Security Council reform. Very much welcome. <laughs> Thank you. So these are the experts that have, uh, together with me, and actually our staff, also including Janine de Roy van Zuiderwijn, who you have uh, seen before. Here is Janine, <laughs> has very much been involved in this process of selecting proposals and making sure the entire process goes smoothly. So a, a warm welcome also to her and uh, very much thanks. Uh, we had a hard, tough task. Um, we have seen a range of proposals, and we were only able to select three. Now, many of you have been included in the voting process on proposals. We have also looked at the contents, at how many votes these proposals got, and unfortunately, we could only select three. Now, the range of proposals is fascinating. Um, the proposals that we have selected, and we will get to these uh, in a minute, are a proposal that is, um, has been submitted in the first instance by Mike Curtis. Here is Mike. Very much welcome. Thank you. A second proposal has been submitted by uh, Joshua Makalintal. Very much welcome, and thank you so much for your submission. And the third proposal has actually been um, made by a group of which Harpreet Ray Singh has been um, um, kind of convener. Now, we are still waiting for a moment uh, to make sure that we actually have a connection. This far, great, and apologies. We obviously have to also struggle with different time zones and all kinds of uh, technical issues. Uh, I should say right away that we had more proposals, um, among them very fascinating ones. Uh, one is actually titled UN Reform Proposal realistic expansionism, and the convener has been Yunubilek Badulga. 
So thank you. Also one of the very, very nice proposals that unfortunately we can't have in the Hangout today, but we have carefully read this. Um, another proposal that we thought was very amazing is the urgency to reform the Security Council, of which the convener was Ray Omori. So thank you all. And again, there were several other proposals that I think are very much worthwhile to look at. But now let us start the process in which we first present the three selected proposals, then we will get feedback by our experts on these proposals, and at the end of this session, we will have a brief exchange of ideas and discussion on this issue that we know has been kind of with the global community for quite a while, uh, United Nations Security Council reform. So very much welcome again for everyone who joins us now live or watches this later on. Let me start out giving the floor to the first group and the convener indeed is Mike Curtis. Mike, please do take the floor. Oh, thank you. Um, our proposal, like most, uh, uh, accepts that uh, the world has changed very much since uh, 1945 when uh, uh, when the Security Council and the United Nations itself was set up. Um, but if we want to look a bit beyond the fact that the, uh, power, stru the power structure between nation states has changed, um, the world has changed a lot since then and is changing rapidly. Technology is driving change in the world. Um, and we see an important part of our proposal, the fact that we should not only make a change now, uh, but we should also set up mechanisms by which we can have a continual process of change so that we can deal with these mechanisms, with the, with the changing world. Um, uh, for example, we now have uh, a global infrastructure. Uh, we have the internet, we have um, communication satellites, positioning satellites, um, we have uh, a permanent presence in space, we have artificial intelligence, and we have autonomous and semi autonomous um, robots in the battlefield at the moment. So. Um, everything is yeah. okay really sorry about that it seems that again the techniques are not with us right now <laughs> There's all kind of things going on there in space, it seems, and they uh, are not really helping us out here in this session. Uh, I think, there we go, we may have Mike. Yeah, sorry, I think my internet connection is choosing today to be bad to go off. <laughs> um, right, so um, we have the, 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 this change and the, and the change of structure. Um, so we see an important part to set up some sort of standing committee, um, probably not just the members of the United, of the United Nations on it, but also uh, from outside, uh, from business, because of course now we have global businesses, um, some of which are richer and more powerful than many states, um, uh, and uh, and uh, academics and others who are all in this field, so that we can have regular reports on how the structure is working. Uh, and, and what new changes are, are, are needed, so that can guide this, uh, this process of change. Um, we're kicking off the change, well, uh, this process, by actually making some immediate changes. Um, and we want to look at, in particular, the particular problems we see as being the, uh, the veto mechanism, the idea of permanent members, um, and uh, just the, the composition as a whole. And we would like to see um, a regional structure, a block structure. Uh, our initial uh, setup will be uh, four blocks based roughly around continents, uh, but that will be one of the things that will be a, a subject to a possible change later. Uh, each each continental block would put in um, two um, semi-permanent members and four other members, so you would be regularly voting in one every two years or so. Um, the semi-permanent members, um, well, obviously we have problems here because the, the current P5 are, are obviously reluctant to give away their current uh, position of, uh, of power in, in the current structure. Um, 
So we like to talk about this not as being permanent, but as being there by right, perhaps. Um, and we see that there's some sort of formula. Um, we we'll say I'm not a mathematician. Actually, I'm a mathematician. Um, uh, but uh, I haven't really worked out the details of the formula. But we also ought to take into account the military might, GDP, um, contributions to the UN, and in particular, stability and peaceful relations with neighbors. Because these are the sort of people that we want if we're going to actually promote peace in the world. Um, and to be quite honest, it, it's very difficult to see how any of the current P5 would fail on any such criteria to be there. So that unless something drastic happens, they would retain their, uh, their, their, their position there uh, without any difficulty. Um, and of course, if, if something massive did have massive changes did occur, well, then why should they keep their permanent position? Um, when there are problems, and um, we see the, the, the role uh, of the Security Council as promoting peace, but you know, more than just reacting to peace. Uh, actually, actually, Mike, uh, sorry for in interrupting. Um, um, it would be great. Uh, is it possible to summarize within like just uh, one to one and a half minutes uh, right now? It's very, very fascinating. We could go on, but we have to make sure that we, uh, we, we can give time to... Uh, okay. it's, it's, as, it's as bad as summarizing in 1,200 words, isn't it? Sorry, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, okay, so um, a current proposal for the regional blocks, uh, and th that involves, because um, we are not talking about two members, that's, that's been about to eight members, we have proposed uh, representatives from places which are not covered in the so uh, Brazil from South uh, America, and South Africa, and Morocco from Africa, which are mainly underrepresented regions. Um, Brazil and South Africa are you know, fairly obvious choices. Morocco, less obvious, but um, we want some sort of contact with the Islamic world. This is where a lot of the problems are. The problems are in the Middle East and the Islamic world and Africa. And uh, if you're looking for states that are stable and peaceful and have good relations with lots of other states in this area, your choice is, is somewhat restricted. Uh, and Morocco does fit that bill. It has relations with the Islamic world and through sub Saharan uh, Africa. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll leave it there for the moment. But, uh, a bit more later, perhaps. Great. Well, thank you very, very much. Um, the, the entire proposal um, has been worked out very nicely and is available on the web page of the course, The Changing Global Order, in the discussion forum. So thank you very, very much. And I should mention again, Mike uh, is the convener of the group. Uh, the other members were Muhadien uh, Chiche. Fyrus Jorgensen and Emmanuel Moser. So thank you very much for this uh, group submission that indeed we have also studied carefully. Thank you so much, uh, Mike, for briefly having summarized this also for us here online. And obviously we will have a chance again to get back and discuss uh, later on in this session. Thank you th very much for this contribution. Also knowing that you're a mathematician gives a nice element uh, to, um, to all of uh, this. Thank you so much. Now we'll actually switch um, to the next group and have a brief presentation on the proposal. Again, uh, the proposal um, has been uh, has been uh, put online, and we move to Josh. We move to uh, Joshua McAlintal, and uh, Joshua, if you could briefly summarize the proposal that has been worked out by your group. Okay, so hello, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, our group, my group. Uh, realizes that the planet in its current global order is uh, geop geopolitically in conflict and divided and we and the uh, global order the, con the countries like the BRICS countries are being acknowledged by by the international international political order and that there is an urgent um, um, reform is currently being no, sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm just. Uh, we we our proposal our proposal is this. We propose to create a regional balance between the institution so that every state would feel that in their interests are being equally represented. Once that ba balance is realized, the the Security Council of the United Nations will fulfill its goal to maintain global peace and security. Our proposal uh, is currently. 
can be summarized into four points. The first point is the redivision of the United Nations Security Council seats. We would really propose to redivide the region, regional representation into, five, in, into six essential groups, the six continental groups. This is North America, Western Europe, Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, Eurasia, Continental Asia, and the Asia Pacific and Oceania. Now, the second point is the semi-permanent membership. We propose to establish such a membership in the United Nations Security Council. This is to avoid the Security Council from being anachronistic by the second half of the century. So we propose adding uh, semi-permanent seats with veto power. The third point is that we are proposing to introduce uh, non-permanent, uh, to reform non-permanent membership seats by, by letting each region nominate one nation in the respective region. This, um, the nominations will be then confirmed by the General Assembly. And we, we also propose in limiting the re-election of non-permanent NSC members. To, this is to to prevent uh, the, uh, the uh, an establishment of a quasi permanent UNSC member. The, the last point is UNSC presidency reform, and this is an important point because we would also be introducing a veto power for such for such a member, and that and uh, this veto can be overridden by the UNSC as well. So this veto power would be something um, would be something different from the mainstream of the Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for uh, briefly presenting uh, your group proposal. Um, do you want to briefly introduce the other members of your group? Uh, should I try? Maybe I'm mispronouncing the names. But, uh... Oh, yeah. I'm gonna... Okay, my group members are um, Tatiana Belitska, Rose Anne Marin Inoseno, Evelyn Kamal, Akansha Kant, Chantal Murillo, Amanda Sura, and Joy Nevada Valdez. Perfect. Thank you very much again uh, for your proposal. Again, also your full entire worked out proposal is indeed available uh, online. Thank you very much, Josh, for taking this up and uh, presenting the proposal here to us online. Thank you so much. So we will get you back into, um, into the discussion uh, later on. I should say that um, we have a third proposal. Uh, the convener of that proposal is Harpreet Ray Singh. Um, his um, group has been working on a proposal called the Inclusive Group on UNSC Reform. A couple of very interesting elements in there, among them the suggestion for a one-year rotating uh, non-permanent um, membership in the Security Council. Um, but unfortunately, that group is not, um, is not here right now. Um, that's sorry. That group is still not in right now. Um, before we take up um, the official discussion on that proposal, maybe we give it another chance and hope that the group somehow manages to get back in. So, Josh, uh, thank you very much for having uh, been the second person uh, presenting the proposal. Um, now, let us start out, and again, we still hope that um, Harpreet or another member of that group will be able to come in uh, themselves and present their proposal. But for now, I suggest that we start giving feedback on the proposals that have already been presented, and again, that we have in full online. Uh, would it be okay um, if we um, start looking at this? Uh, uh, William Pace, um, we hope it will be okay for you, Bill, to start commenting first on these uh, two proposals, and hopefully later on, Harpreet will be able to join. If not, we kind of will try to give feedback online without the presentation itself, but the document that we have in hand. Would that be okay for you? Can you hear me now? I'd be happy to go forward. Okay. Uh, well, thank you. And in fact, I prepared uh, my notes on the basis of uh, three or four or five of the different proposals that we uh, discussed. So, first, I wanted to say that uh, it's, I think, a very important issue that the 
uh, Leiden uh, MOOC course uh, took on uh, uh, at United Nations headquarters. Uh, you cannot count even a handful of non-governmental organizations who are following the Security Council reform and expansion negotiations um, or who are, are engaged in deep political and intellectual dialogue and discussion. Uh, you do have groups following it from a nationalistic point of view, but uh, not from uh, a global uh, governance reform uh, viewpoint. So I think this type of a course is extremely important. Uh, I also should say that there have been massive changes in the Security Council uh, since the end of the Cold War. Um, the explosion of peacekeeping, peace enforcement resolutions, uh, international justice uh, uh, bodies created. There's also, uh, which is not evident in the in the proposals, a much stronger role that has been asserted by the elected or democratic members of the council, though there are two-year terms and the ability of the permanent members with the veto to block reform in the council cannot be overstated. Uh, and also, while governments, uh, for many reasons, do not admit it, I, I wanted to, or advertise it, I, I think it's very important to note that the reform of the United Nations Security Council is the reform of arguably the most powerful body in the international legal order. There is no other intergovernmental body that has been given the power of that Chapter 7 authority and the Security Council provisions of the Charter confer. And uh, therefore, it, it's not surprising that there is so much uh, uh, political uh, uh, attention, but under the radar, and it is a tragedy that uh, the international media that cover UN issues is not covering this negotiation more. Um, the second point I wanted to make in, in preference is while almost everyone talked about the veto in the proposals, hardly anyone recognized the reality that for the first 60 some years of the, of the UN, most governments complained about the veto but loved the veto because as long as your your government was protected by a, a veto member, then you could prevent the council from interfering in what you thought were your domestic affairs, uh, how you, your human rights issues, your uh, uh, religious uh, issues, your development issues, your, uh, how you ran your economy, etc. And it's again only in this last 15 or 20 years uh, that we have seen perhaps a majority of member states of the 193 uh, member states of the UN who are willing actually to have the Security Council do proper peacekeeping and peace enforcement. And it's still out because, as you know, uh, the, the, there are still many countries that look forward to being protected by a veto member, whether it's in the Middle East or Asia or, or South America, etc. Um, uh, I also should mention, I think, in advance that I think it is possible and perhaps even likely that the permanent membership and the possession of the veto has prevented World War III in the last 69 years and perhaps more than once, and uh, that's rarely raised. Uh, these proposals, I think, were very stimulating and, uh, and that they emerged from group exercises and over in only a few days warrants, I think, uh, tremendous uh, congratulations. And I would encourage that some of these uh, processes would go on where you actually would spend weeks or months in some of the ex similar exercises. Um, the... It, negotiations on the expansion of the council, which have been and reform of working methods of the council, have been going on since 1993 and and especially 1996. So they have been stalemated, and I also do not think they will become uh, able to move forward unless NGOs uh, from the south and the north, east and west, get engaged with some progressive proposals and put the pressures on the governments uh, to move to move forward. Now, the proposed raise issues in the different proposals that we're talking about this morning raise the issues of the veto, of ending the veto, of extending the veto to 
uh, to other countries, our member states, or, or to regions uh, of greater General Assembly control and oversight of the Security Council, of creating complementary bodies that, uh, like a consultative body that would be needed to trigger final decisions by the Council, um, the proposals of semi-permanent uh, seats and renewable voting seats of the Middle East as a new region, a separate region and, and voting bloc. Um, uh, some had were, I think, uh, proposed no new permanent members. Uh, I thought the proposal on reforming the Security Council presidency and who would be able to hold the pin, that is, who, who could control the drafting of resolutions, almost all of which is now controlled by the permanent members of the council. Uh, these, I think, were very important uh, uh, proposals in the, in, in the uh, uh, four or five and, and the three that we're discussing uh, this morning. Um, almost all raised the issue of greater regional international organization representation in the council, uh, which I think is a very progressive and relevant. It's, it, w it is going to be almost impossible to achieve uh, under the current charter, and as many of you have noted, the charter can only be amended by two-thirds vote in the General Assembly, and then two-thirds of all the governments uh, ratifying the amendment including a positive decision by all five of the permanent members. Um, some of you proposed a judicial review of Security Council reforms, which I think is extremely important uh, and, and, and relevant, uh, and, and I think it will happen um, probably through the International Criminal Court in the not-too-distant uh, future. Um, a main disappointment that I had in all the proposals was that they mainly dealt with the global power politics issues, the misorientation in, the, in, in 2014, different uh, geopolitical situation in 1945. But the issues of how the Security Council could achieve its, its having, it has primary responsibility in the international legal order, primary, not exclusive, but primary responsibility for maintaining international peace and security. It is clear that the international community is failing in this maintenance of peace and security. And I would have hoped that the groups would have paid more attention to that failure and instead of just how do you reorient and, and get other power centers on the, the council because I'm not certain that just rearranging the power base of the council will in fact uh, achieve the improvements. Um, so for, for my organization, we think the work, the reforming the working methods of the council are as important reforms as the representation issues. The other issue that was implied but not spelled out in a number of the proposals was the re relationship with regional international organizations like the European Union, the African Union, the West African, uh, ECOWAS, the OAS, ASEAN, etc. Uh, some of these, in particular the EU, AU, ECOWAS, have been providing major conflict prevention, peacekeeping, and peace enforcement actions in the last 20 years. But none of these have any formal recognition by the Security Council or relationship to the Security Council. And so I was very pleased to see the proposals that indicated that this had to begin. Um, but I think it, it's, it's uh, not only in terms of representation, but in terms of, of how the Council would work with the regional organizations in, in peacekeeping and peace enforcement. Um, and uh, I guess uh, other issues I was wondering is uh, many talked about having weights that to be on council it would be helpful if you if you took into consideration what a government could contribute to peace. This is in fact in the charter and completely ignored in the elections to the Security Council and I think that would be very important. And for my organization we would love to see a more serious discussion of a, of a more of a modest international peace force at the UN, uh, 10, 20, 25,000 who were not national uh, soldiers that were assigned to peacekeeping but who were part of an international force that could help uh, train, etc. Um, but again, I think I, since I've taken my time, I'll, I'll leave it there and then help be able to answer uh, specific questions on, the, on, on some of the proposals.
Thank you very much. I think that uh, was kind of a very uh, clear message to all of us and also reminding us of the fact again how important um, the Security Council is in terms of the maintenance of peace and stability and how powerful the institution is considering what is available on a global uh, scale. Um, let me now switch right away uh, to uh, Thomas Durfler. Uh, Thomas, may, may, may I invite you to also comment upon the suggestions that uh, have been made in the proposals? Well, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you very much for um, organizing this MOOC. Uh, it has been, I assume it has been tremendous work uh, for you and your team and you, I think you made a great job and thank you also for, for inviting me into, into this hangout and, and uh, having, the, having a chance to participate and uh, and share my the ideas that I have and and, and the, the previous work that I have done on on uh, the Security Council reform uh, issue and it has been very interesting to 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 see all these proposals um, and sort of connected to 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 the knowledge I gained when I did my research and my trips to New York. Um, let me have some some um, yeah um, yeah I think. Okay. Uh, oh, Harpreet, welcome. Please uh, wait a second. Thanks yeah, yeah, yeah. Here. We're very happy with that, but please uh, wait a second. Thomas is now speaking, so we will introduce you in a minute. Thanks. Okay. Let me let me first make some general comments. Um, yeah, please, on. I don't want to disturb anybody. Please continue. Uh, s sorry about this interruption, uh, uh, Thomas. It turns out that Har Harpreet just came into the picture. Harpreet, very much uh, welcome. We had already started uh, presenting the other two proposals and we're getting some comments. Uh, so maybe at this point it is uh, best, if you don't mind, uh, briefly muting uh, yourself. Uh, thank you so much for coming in and uh, after the feedback by Thomas Dorfler, we'll get back to you to present the proposal. Okay, thank you so much for having come in and let us switch back to Thomas Dorfler. Uh, apologies for the interruption. That's all right. I'm, I'm happy to have uh, one more uh, one more group involved and we can we can also sort of uh, exchange views on, on the third proposal, so that's very good. Um, so just a very few um, general comments, and basically I, I add on what, what William already had said. I think I, I agree to, to basically all of what he said, uh, or most of what he said, and just some additional comments. When I read through, I had the feeling that uh, most of the proposals, or basically all of the proposals were very well formulated. They were very innovative and creative. And this is something that might miss in New York, in the discussions in New York, uh, getting some fresh ideas, some fresh thoughts about how you could rearrange, because the discussions that are going on are pretty much fixed on, on proposals that are out for a number of years already. Um, it is obvious that all the participants invested a lot of thought and energy into developing uh, these proposals into basically what it is, is solving the reform issue, uh, trying to solve it, um, and what I found most interesting is to see the diverse range of proposals. Um, if you're much involved in the academic discussion about the issue, it's it's all pretty much sort of centering around like Western ideas and Western proposals. So it has been interesting to see people coming from from different areas, having their thoughts, um, their position, and that was quite refreshing for me as well. Uh, I also like the inclusion of thinking about what role could internet, international organizations, or regional organizations play, uh, what role in general could regions play, uh, regional blocks play, uh, how did they evolve, evolve? Is, it, is it smart the way they are sort of, sort of the composition of regional blocks, does that actually make sense, should we rearrange them? And also the role of the General Assembly, one of the proposals was suggesting having a different voting system in a General Assembly to come up basically to come up with a different set of Security Council because you have to change the charter. So it, it's not just related to the Security Council but also to how the General Assembly works and how, how the charter reform could, could actually um, proceed. Um, I also realized that there is a common sense that there really is a huge need for reform of the Council. 
And also I sense in most of the proposals that the solution many people would advocate for would be semi-permanent seats. So having something between non-permanent and permanent seats. So seats that, that they're for four, five, six, or maybe even longer years. So apparently this seems to be a, a good compromise for, for many who think about the topic. And I also realize that many have the notion that it's very, very difficult to change, indeed. And of course, that was also inspired by the video lectures and, and the readings we had. But this is what I got from what also many wrote in their proposals. It, it will be difficult. Um, two factors that have been left out, I think, from my perspective, also what William already said, uh, many of the proposals have focused on the formal reform part. And I think what is more feasible to achieve, still difficult, but more feasible would be uh, the reform of the working methods. And there has been slow but steady progress on, on this issue. And there also have been sort of like-minded state groups or reform groups, like the small five, or recently the ACT accountability coherence uh, transparency uh, initiatives that, that try to push for, for working methods reforms. Um, and there have been changes in, in years, although it's, it's steady, but steady and small. But but there is some change, and this this has not been really the focus of the proposal. So most, or, or almost all, focused on on the formal reform part. Um, the proposal is also left out, I think, which is a central question to the whole reform issue in any international organization. The question uh, effectiveness versus representation. So there is this assumption that the council is not effective. And the assumption is also, if we increase um, the membership, it will be more effective. At least that's what I got from most of the proposals. And I think there is a trade-off. Um, you, you, you can have a small body uh, which is more effective, and you can have a more representative body which then it will be more difficult uh, to come up with decisions because you have more players, you have more interests, and depending on the voting rules, you, it might actually get more difficult to make decisions. A good example here would be uh, the European Commission. There's a steady discussion about uh, if it should be like 28 members in the Commission, if that's really efficient. It's probably not, uh, but it's representative. And so, so for me, uh, a, a reform proposal should actually argue um, for why it is better to have a more representative council or an increased membership. Because the P5, they would always argue, and that's what they do in the discussions, it is the most effective as it is now. It, it is most sort of, now it, it's the most able to come up with decisions. Uh, and if it's increased to 25 or even to 30, um, it will be much less able to make decisions. And that's a good argument. I mean, that's an argument you have to counter. And I think this was also missing in some of the proposals to tell us why their setup is actually better. Um, yeah, I think that will be the general comments. Do you want me to, to engage on the, on the individual proposals now, or should we jump in and uh, let uh, Harpeet uh, 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 sort of introduce his proposal? I think it might be very nice uh, right now to uh, indeed have Harpreet come in uh, briefly, three to four minutes max, uh, present uh, the proposal of his group, and indeed, if you don't mind, uh, Thomas, we'll get back um, uh, for feedback uh, very specifically on the on the three proposals. Yes, Harpreet, um, welcome. <laughs> Great, um, Harpreet, you can hear us and see us. Um, you are in a totally uh, different time zone than we are. <laughs> you are muted. Um, Harpreet, um, is there a way to get your sound back on on your own uh, computer? Can you hear yeah. us? <laughs> you have to move your mouse uh, to the top of the screen and they see a microphone button. And you have to click that and then you can unmute yourself. Because you are still on mute. Harpreet, so if you go to the top of your screen, there's a button with a microphone. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, can, can, you, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Good. <laughs> okay, Harpreet, okay. I think yeah. Fine, yeah. Fine, fine. we can hear. Uh, okay, I, I just want to uh, thank thank everybody once again. Yeah. 
and without without wasting any more time i'll just get on with my proposal should i yeah yes please do harpreet yes thank you hello yeah uh, so basically the proposal is almost similar to what the g4 had proposed earlier and i've just yeah hello and it was said in the lectures that the the g4 proposal was just nearly going to be accepted and then the regional rivalries began and they sort of infected the whole process uh, so what we propose is we want we propose that the unsc should be expand, uh, uh, expanded to 27 members p5 plus 11 permanent members without veto and 11 elected non permanent members and these elected non permanent members should be elected annually every year and the 11 permanent members without veto should be the g4 plus pakistan plus netherlands plus one uh, other than brazil from south america uh, internally elected and recommended by unasur the regional organization there and two seats internally elected and recommended by the african union and uh, one seat uh, from the uh, we wrote in the proposal it should be from the arab league but we think it should be from the oic that is the organization of uh, islamic conference uh, to increase the scope of uh, participation of the islamic states uh, and they should be australia and in the trade off we asked the p5 to somehow uh, make the UNSC more effective by uh, not allowing just one country to solve the whole process of 200 countries around the world and maybe at least if not a simple majority within the V5 they should be uh, at least two of the five powers who should agree to a veto so that UNSC becomes more effective. Uh, thirdly there was a proposal by one of our members that the International Court of Justice should be strengthened so that the decisions of UNSC are uh, are in a judicial check they are scrutinized by an international court of justice uh, other than that uh, we have mentioned other than UNSC that the amendment process of United Nations Charter is uh, has to be amended a bit because uh, a country like Nauru with um, with a population of 10,051 cannot be equated to a country like India with a population of 1.2 billion I mean how can the both have just the same vote strength in, in the general assembly so that needs to be changed um, somehow we gave a proposal that uh, Nauru's population should get one vote and the total population of the world should be divided by Nauru's population and that should be the total number of votes in the general assembly and then we can have the other process uh, the way we can do it uh, regarding p5 thinking that this is the most effective I think I'll just add a few seconds of idealism here I, I, I know myself to be an idealist uh, practicalist so I think whatever is practicable in in the idealism should be tried out so why do we need world peace and security first of all for which UNS should be uh, effective we need world prosperity in order to uh, we need peace so that we can prosper together so so that the rich and poor divide can somehow be reduced because if there is a big difference between rich and poor the conflict will always be there there will be violence there will be problems so we have to have a great UNSC which is which acts as a deterrence to any kind of violence so but why do we need UNSC as a deterrence we need it so that we can achieve something like the eight millennium development goals which the UN has set and uh, if we want to achieve something like that then it makes important it, it becomes important that we ha have peace on earth uh, globally but if we just want peace so that the rich remain rich or they keep becoming richer and the poor are sort of sort of defeat the ultimate purpose of humanity to which we all belong and UNSC UN being one of our biggest uh, achievements in a way so this is all that's it Hello. Yes. I cannot hear you now. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Hello. Sorry, Harpreet. Um, I thank you so much for having summarized. Ma'am, is 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 your microphone on mute? Uh, 
Yeah, yeah, there you are. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. It is indeed. We have. We should not forget to unmute ourselves. Um, but, but when we get out, we have to think about everything at the same time. Don't be all of us involved in this discussion. Thank you so much, Harpreet, for having presented this. Actually, Harpreet, may I ask you? Uh, is it possible for you to briefly um, um, give the names of the people that were involved in your group? Thank you. Okay, um, else I'll, I'll do my best. Um, Abdella Umer, Colette Mathieu Telbo, Julio Lorenzo Cagno, Juliana Mercedes Romero Sipan, Dubravko Aladic, Shulki Yang, Kamal Edil Salah. I uh, realize that when I read the names, um, your proposal is very much the inclusive group on UN reform, we saw it in your presentation. We also see it in the list of names. I think uh, a very international effort, that's exactly what happens in the reality, trying globally to get to a solution somehow, uh, sometime. I think it gets time now. Um, we have to watch the time, to put it that way. Let us very briefly get back um, to some concrete feedback on the proposals. Uh, Thomas was going to comment briefly on the proposals again, and then what we will actually do is have a short remaining section of this um, um, online discussion where we have a chance our group presenters can ask very pointed specific questions and we'll have uh, specific answers uh, to those questions. And then unfortunately uh, we will already need to uh, round off the online discussion. But uh, So let us uh, now briefly uh, blend back to Thomas. Okay, just I, I try to be short. I, I realize the uh, time's uh, running out a bit. Uh, I try to be short. So first to to Mike's proposal, um, which I think was uh, one of the more radical in, in that respect proposals um, that 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 were that were out there. And I liked uh, the idea that it introduces basically two logics of selection for for members. The first is the one with the fixed formula, which is in some kind of way a non-political sort of selection. I mean, of course, you have to decide about which criteria, GDP, military capabilities, and, and, and whatnot, um, which criteria you use, but this is sort of a non-political selection. So you get a list, and you get the top five, and you choose the top five, or how many you want. And you couple that with a political selection within the blocks, or like a voting or a nomination by, by the regional blocks. So that was a was an interesting idea. That also is some somehow goes back to 1945, right? Uh, we have the the most powerful members in 1945, which then entered into the council as permanent members, and then ten, which well, later on ten, uh, that are they are voted basically what is also now but by, by regional blocks. Um, your proposal touches uh, the P5 position. Um, it sort of rethinks the veto or abolishes uh, the veto. And it also really thinks the evolution of the regional blocs. I mean, if you think about the Western European group, where also you have countries like uh, Australia or Canada, and I mean, this is an interesting regional group because it's not really regional, right? So your proposal also tries to rethink these groups. So how did they came about? What what kind of countries are are represented here, and should should we have a different sort of different sort of setup? Um, what it also introduces is an equality in numbers. So you have, for each regional group, you have the same amount of members. Um, but I don't know how, if that would really be manageable. Um, you see, Europe will get uh, six, six seats, but also Africa will get six seats. And they will say, well, we are more members, right? So we will be underrepresented here. So I don't know if they would sort of give in to this proposal saying Europe is represented the same or each block should be represented equally because blocks are different in size. So they want both the bigger blocks more members and the smaller blocks should get less members. I, I, I just said um, I like the, the idea of the formula. Um, so how to select these, um, although I don't think it's very feasible, but it's a, it's a, it's a fresh idea. Um, I think a major problem here is how to how to weigh, weigh these different elements of your formula, the GDP, military capabilities, and then especially the one with the history of peaceful relations. 
I mean, there are a couple of countries that would argue that they, are, there's some, they themselves are very peaceful or have a peaceful history. So how far does history go back? And what? Do, so so how do you determine that? And I mean, you could argue for 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 a lot of countries that they had a peaceful history, but you would not consider them like a great contributor to international peace, right? So that it's it's a very very it's not very feasible this sort of the sort of selection criteria. Uh, and also, I think you with the with that formula, and then with your selection of of uh, semi permanent members, you somehow seem to break with the formula because you say. Germany should not get the seat, but the, U the UK and France. And if you if you look at your formula, I would say Germany would probably be on top, uh, or before UK and France. So I don't really see how how you can have the formula and then break with the formula in the same sort of proposal. Um, okay. Um, and the final question is: Who determines the composition of regional blocks? I mean, we have regional blocks, so who would decide about this? And how could one member be? be I, I see the practical difficulties having one member being part of two blocks. I don't know how that how that would work. Uh, I mean, if if you're in, cent in Central Europe, you can't be part of two blocks. But if you're uh, in North uh, Africa, you can be a member of two blocks. So you have two options to get into the council, but in Europe, not. So how would that work? Um, so should I go on to to the other proposals and shortly comment on them? Yes, I think that would be a possibility to have very brief feedback and indeed uh, at the end of our discussion we will um, get back uh, in a more general sense. Yes, if you had some concise feedback, thank you, yes. Okay, I'll try to keep it short. Um, the second group, um, you, you had this element with the, with the regional groups involved and I think it's, a, it's also a fresh idea but I, I, I see a lot of difficulties uh, with that. Um, basically two. One is if you have these regional groups involved and now you see if you take Ukraine how difficult it was for the EU, EU, EU to come up with a common position. So how would that work in the Security Council? I mean how should these regional organizations then come up with, uh, with a common position? If you take the African Union it's fifth, almost 50 members so how would they come up with a common position on, on, on a security issue? I, I think it's not very likely and it wouldn't add much um, to the debate. The second problem, uh, you say they should have observer status. Uh, this won't matter for decision making. I mean, how would, how would those who want to push for a proposal in the council go about? First, one will draft a text and they will the P3, UK, France, US will discuss it, then the P5. And then maybe your P12, uh, the, 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 the new permanent members here, you're involved, and then they will go to the full council when the decision is already made. They will ask the observers, so they will not make a difference. That I think if they have observer status, they won't make a difference. Also, I think uh, an issue with your proposal is that you you raise um, the number of veto powers uh, to 12. You have 12 out of 21 members will be veto powers, so 60% of the council will have veto power, and that's a lot. I mean. Oh, I don't see how you can make decisions at all, meaningful decisions at all, with that high number of veto players involved. And maybe I shortly also get to to the other, um, to the final um, proposal. Um, you also had this um, this idea of having sort of two selection criteria, which which I liked. Um, so there's a sense that we need some we need some important members in there that have the strengths and capabilities to actually make a make a meaningful change or impose security, so responsible powers. And you like to add with sort of um, elected members to increase like the broader representation of the smaller memberships of those countries who don't really have the capabilities but might have an interesting say or might contribute uh, sort of to, to the decisions. Um, I see a problem that Africa doesn't get a new permanent seat and no veto. Um, they are not likely to agree to this. Uh, and this, this, I mean, most of the proposals also said, I mean, it's important to have broad consensus. 
And you should you should try to balance all the regional blocks, but because without them you you won't get uh, a compromise. And the same goes for you you try to to balance India with the addition of Pakistan, which is a good idea. I mean, having the middle powers in the regions involved in the council, so get them into the proposal, so they will agree to it. But you don't do this for Brazil, so a country would be Argentina. Uh, Germany, or a contender would be Italy or Spain, or Japan, where a contender would be um, South Korea, for example. Um, so middle powers in Europe and Asia would be antagonized by this proposal. I think this this is a realistic, um, realistic um, perspective on this. Um, but in general, it's, uh, I enjoyed reading it too. So all of the proposals. So uh, you invested a lot of work and, and, and thought and, into it, and, and I was really happy to to read all through all of those. And if you have questions, uh, I'll be be happy to take some. Great, thank you very much. That was indeed a very detailed uh, feedback on some of the proposals. Um, let me very briefly, before we have a very last uh, opportunity for the presenters to ask very concise uh, questions or add an additional comment, um, then we will have to move towards closing remarks by our um, uh, experts. Let me just very briefly say that the MOOC, um, the Changing Global Order, has taken us through some of the major reform proposals, going back to the high-level panel on challenges uh, um, uh, on change sounds as a threat, and, and taking us through like G4 proposal, uniting for consensus, and then uh, lots of proposals that have come in later. I think many of the proposals that we saw now have built on these proposals, have taken us into the current situation, into current figures actually on things like economic power, on population, on other measures that could somehow be crucial in terms of giving some justification about who should sit on the council and in which capacity, permanent, non-permanent, should there be other veto rights, should there rather be new constructs, and indeed, yes, the other option that has also been mentioned by Bill Pace, the importance of the change of working methods um, instead of formal reform. So thank you so much again for all these contributions that have looked at these different suggestions, all the proposals, newer versions of that, and then own creative ideas about what else could be taken into account. Before we have this very last exchange of thoughts, let me also say that it seems that the hurdle for change, uh, we know the formal hurdle for change, but that is indeed something that encourages status quo bias. It is a lot to have two-thirds of the General Assembly, domestic ratification, the G5 included, and get to a proposal that everyone can agree with. And it has not gotten easier between the beginning of the UN and now, because there are so many more members. So that hurdle, in a way, has also gotten steeper and steeper. Actually, Thomas and I have also worked on that subject a bit, so we shouldn't be amazed. It's such a huge enterprise. Well, let's get now back. Let's give our presenters a last chance to either briefly comment or ask a specific question. Then we turn back to our two uh, experts outside Leiden, and then we'll round off. May I invite uh, first uh, Mike back uh, to ask either a question or comment very briefly on what has been said. Uh, right, uh, partly question, part comment. Um, all the our proposals, as well as most all proposals, uh, contain anomalies, uh, but so does the current system. Um, and uh, I would have thought that one of the most important things was to actually set up a system which will actually iron out these anomalies, um, because whatever you're going to do, you're going to introduce some more anomalies. Um, and I think the other quick point that I would like to make is that um, the Security Council and the United Nations have really prevented World War III in the first few years after the Second World War. But I thought probably the major factor that's preventing war now is the fact that the economies are all intertwined. Um, uh, on the other point there is that there probably is a world war going on at the moment, given the amount of warfare that's going on uh, throughout the world. And because of that amount of, water, of warfare that's going on, uh, many people would actually say that the United Nations Security Council is failing. If it's still going on, it shows no signs of actually stopping. And that the longer we actually argue, uh, the more people are going to get killed. Um, and as Harpreet said, 
Um, you know, the major problem is the difference between the rich and the poor. Uh, and unless you actually do something that's going to uh, attack that particular problem, you're just going to get more and more wars. If you just add on more and more of the powerful states so that they can introduce their own internal politics and argue among themselves, it is not going to say, solve any of the problems. You're just going to get more and more warfare. Uh, and and in, in, if that happens, the United Nations and security may well become irrelevant. Um, so I, I, I want to emphasize that change is important. Something has to happen. Uh, and, and hopefully that can be small, provided you have a mechanism that will keep it changing uh, to take into account changing situations. Thank you very much uh, for these final comments. Uh, Joshua, may I invite you to give some final thoughts or ask a question? Yeah. Um, yeah regarding the issue of the vetoes, uh, I admit that the, the 12 vetoes would be unproductive. And after considering feedback regarding that issue, my group has come to the conclusion that the vetoes of semi-permanent members um, would be would be limited in a way. For example, uh, semi-permanent members maybe would, would only have one veto as a group, meaning that the, indi the individual member uh, members would have no veto. So that would mean that that they may veto a proposal if there is at least maybe a five-two majority. So yeah, limiting vetoes make those semi-permanent members have a collective veto. And <coughs> Yeah, I think that's all I can say. Comment on that. Thank you very much. Yes, and thanks again for uh, the proposal that you and your group have worked out. Also, uh, Mike and his proposal. Also, thank you to uh, Heartbreak, who unfortunately kind of got out of this uh, session again, but uh, we have him included, fortunately, that he was able to uh, present a proposal. Now, let me go back uh, to William Pace in New York. William. Thank, you, thank you very much. Uh, well, very quick. I agree with uh, others that have indicated, as, as you did, uh, that the chances of extending the veto are almost zero. The U.S. Senate, the Russian Duma, China will not extend the veto, I think, in anyone's lifetime on this show. Uh, two, uh, that uh, we are looking at uh, reorganizing according to existing new emerging powers and hegemonies, but what will change in 40 or 50 more years? There will be different ones. So I think the idea of finding a system which allows future powers uh, also to not feel on the outside is, is, is important. In fact, I think what we're seeing is a, is a globalization of democratic governments. And, and the small and middle power democracies, I think, are probably going to be the most important governance mechanism in global governance and in regional international organization governance uh, going forward, and I think that's a hopeful uh, sign. Um, I would point out to people that there are a number of proposals very similar to the ones that you've done that have been uh, being nurtured for the last 30 or so years, the binding triad proposal, um, uh, Joseph Schwartzberg has just produced a major book on transforming uh, the United Nations uh, system, which has even more provocative and unrealistic proposals than anyone here in 20 or 15 regions, etc. But a fascinating book in, in its own right. Um, I think the the it, what you can find from the Security Council report organization, from the Center for UN Reform, and and to monitor this ACT initiative that the Swiss government is coordinating with 23 countries is, are, are very, very important. I think the regional international organizations will be the place where we can reform and strengthen them on peacekeeping, peace prevention, uh, etc. And that should be done. On the issue, you do not want the UN Security Council to be dealing with uh, global economic inequity. You want the General Assembly and other more democratic bodies to be addressing uh, global environment, uh, sustainable development, uh, 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 global regulations. Not the well, not the Security Council. It should be restricted to the peace and security issues. And I do want to also mention quickly that. 
the creation of the International Criminal Court uh, and the adoption of the responsibility to protect norm, I think, uh, which have both been recognized even though major powers on the council have uh, serious, uh, have not ratified the treaties, but they both had to be recognized. These are important forces for peace. Thank you. Thank you very much for these uh, closing uh, remarks from your slides. So from New York, uh, directly commented uh, here in our hangout. Uh, let me get back to uh, Thomas for brief uh, closing remarks. Okay, um, yeah, yeah, just a few final remarks. Um, one is uh, more of a pessimistic sort and the other of a more optimistic. Uh, the pessimistic one is that I had the chance uh, last uh, fall to to attend a discussion in the General Assembly, the, the annual debate on the Security Council reform. And there the, the sort of the divisive, divisive is contentious issue was if the President of the General Assembly would be allowed to establish an advisory group out of six, seven governments to sort of um, keep on discussions on, on the reform. And a lot of the countries were fiercely opposed to to sort of any outside um, advisory groups or anything that takes away the discussion rep, um, away from, from the intergovernmental negotiations. So, so also I got the sense that now governments are focusing more on this working methods than really on the formal reform because you see it's very, very difficult, it's a very divisive issue. So that's on a negative note, but also three um, positive, posit what I, I think positive or as a political scientist I have to make these positive statements. I, first of all, I think um, there has been in, 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 uh, in, in writing about the Security Council this negative bias um, because we always, we hear a lot about what the Council is not doing, where it is divided where the issues are contentious um, but even if you have contentious issues like Syria or Ukraine that doesn't mean that the council is not working a lot on other projects so if you go on the Security Council website you see a lot of resolutions coming out of its decision machinery it has a lot of subsidiary bodies that work that work uh, during during contentious issues you know Ukraine, if you have a conflict in Ukraine doesn't mean that you cannot have decisions on other parts so I think there is this negativity bias in, in reporting. And of course, some some issues it could do more, but it doesn't mean that it's completely ineffective. Uh, the second would be the veto can also change. Although it's it's an abs it's absolute in the charter, uh, you see in its application that it practices do change, and and even the major powers are very very reluctant to to use the veto. They they try not to use it. Uh, so there is some sort of political costs involved into using the veto. And you see even um, the Chinese and the Russians giving in to, to a referral uh, of Darfur and Libya to the International Criminal Court, although they are opposed to the court in general, right? So you see there are, there are also limits to the veto power. And this might also change in the future. And the third is, um, and some of the proposals already mentioned that, there are regional organizations out there. and they could play a stronger role in peace and security issues. Um, the African Union is, is trying hard to, uh, to do more on these issues. They have their own Peace and Security Council, uh, which somehow resembles the Security Council, by the way. Um, so th they could be involved more. And interestingly, this is already foreseen in the UN Charter. There's a whole chapter on the involvement of regional organizations. So they could have a much different role uh, than they have now. Could, could be much more involved than they are now. I mean, we heard already the EU is very much involved, but there is, I think, ways uh, this could be improved. So, so there are optimistic things. So I wouldn't see everything totally pessimistic, although there is probably not going to be much formal change in the future. So you see, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm still a bit on the optimistic side here. Yes, that's probably what we all need. We need optimism. I was actually thinking Security Council reform, uh, to take the metaphor of the group earlier on, seems to itself face uh, threats, challenges, and change. An important organization, obviously, in today's uh, world order, and an organization that is faced very much with the challenge to adapt or reform in one way or another. 
I would like at this point uh, to first uh, thank very much again the participants in this online discussion. Uh, William Place, who joined us from New York, Thomas Dörfler, who joined us from Germany, Mike Curtis, who came in um, as a metician and a MOOC participant, uh, Joshua Makilintal, who also came in as a participant in this MOOC, Heart Rate Racing, also very much involved in uh, this online course. Now, before I conclude, again, uh, very much appreciated the contributions by all groups to um, thinking and creative thinking about how the Security Council could be adapted and how this could be done in practice. What does it need? How could maybe this huge hurdle be overcome? Now, when I thank everyone, uh, let me also make sure that I very briefly thank uh, two people who are in the room here with me. One person that I'll uh, very briefly want to get uh, into the picture, here we go. I hope everyone can see them. Uh, Danny, thank you so much for all your support. Uh, technical problems get solved when Danny is there. So anyone faces those problems, call Danny. Here we have Janine de Roy van Sardewijn. Sorry that she is kind of hiding a bit, but many of the MOOC uh, participants have actually been in touch with her. And thank you so much again for all your contributions in this course. Janine, I think without you, this course would have been a uh, huge challenge. <laughs> You're very modest, but thank you so much. Anything you would like to uh, say? Well, thanks to all the participants for your great input. I also read the proposals, and I think they were very creative ideas. And, and thanks to the experts, So and, and thanks to you, of course, Madeleine, for this great <laughs> course. So I think I can thank you from all the participants. <laughs> That is very, very kind. Okay, at this point, uh, again, I think it was a wonderful experience, and this is an amazing activity where we have people not working for grades, not working to get points, not working to get a specific diploma, but just working to think creatively about, essentially, how we can get peace and security for this world in the future. A huge challenge, and if we make small contributions to that, I think we are all very happy. So at this point, let me thank everyone again. Thank you for everyone who watches our online, or later actually, saved discussion. Thanks for our two experts, and thanks to our participants of the MOOC for your wonderful contributions. Also, all the groups who have actively contributed. Goodbye, and thank you for thinking with us, thinking globally, thinking internationally. Thank you very much.